our mission is to enable the world's transition to clean energy with the ultimate goal of dramatically improving people's quality of life while protecting the environment. In order to achieve this mission, we must prioritize our efforts to focus on a clean energy technology that's both affordable and safe. So we'll focus on the activities we've been doing to make sure that this can come to reality. We've been around since 2016. We're singularly focused on the commercialization of a fluoride high temperature salt cooled reactor. We call it a FHR technology. That's our mission. And the goal is to deploy it for commercialization for US power generation as early as 2030, but hopefully sooner with rapid deployment loops in the 2030s at scale. Our targets to make sure that we can make this economic are to compete with the current US natural gas market. Our headquarters is based in Alameda, California. You can see on the left there. It also houses two of our research laboratories, a rapid lab, which we call our lab, which is small scale separate effects tests done with simulant fluids and a salt lab, which gives us salt capabilities in terms of handling both beryllium salts and other surrogate salts that we use in our research and development. This also houses a lot of our in situ mechanical testing, our small salt loops, salt pots, and other test rigs that are done at different types of fluids. We have a newer facility that's coming online still in New Mexico that we purchased. And that facility will house a large engineering test unit test and also qualification testing and Lauren along with some vertical integration manufacturing capabilities. We have our reactor site that we've closed on uh, the, for the Hermes demonstration reactor. This is located just down the road from Oak Ridge there on the old K33 site. We have a partnership with Materion and we have our molten salt pilot plant, which is being constructed in Elmore, Ohio. And we also have a licensing office in Charlotte, North Carolina, and that's our current facilities list. So we are expanding. A little bit of that timeline I talked about, we began the construction at the hangar in 2017 for our headquarters on Alameda Island. Um, Rapid Lab came into fruition when we moved into that site in 2018. We started our pre-application engagement with the NRC on those activities, primarily for the power reactor at that point, but it's transitioned to the demonstration reactor. We purchased the facility in New Mexico in 2020, formalized our partnership with Materion after that, and then our salt lab was commissioned in Alameda in July 2020. So you can see, even though uh, COVID hit there in the middle of some of that, we kept working hard. We also won an ARDP award for a demonstration reactor for the Hermes reactor. So that was a um, risk reduction award. It's a total of about $303 million to get that site up and running. It also encompasses some of the support facilities uh, that go along with that. You can see the T facility shell was under construction as well at that point. In January 2021, we commissioned, we started construction of our fuel pebble development labs. So that's looking at the compact form of the fuel. Finalized a cooperative agreement in May this year with TVA to support work with Hermes and other activities. And in June, we actually completed the T facility shell and non-nuclear pebble development lab have gone into production. You can see also then uh, later in that year, just a couple months ago, we, we began in earnest the geotechnical work for the Hermes reactor site. Actually on site there drilling boreholes, examining the previous existing left behind foundation from the K33 site and the diffusion plant. And in September 2021, uh, this is a new announcement. We actually submitted the preliminary safety analysis report for the Hermes demonstration reactor to the NRC. Uh, that's in uh, acceptance review process now. Following that pretty quickly will be the other part of the construction permit application, which is the environmental report. A little bit on our technology basis, we've pretty much heard about it through the other presenters. The difference of Kairos is we are not a fuel salt. So we actually have a solid fuel form and a compact. It's in the form of a pebble. We move those pebbles through the core, circulate them outside of the, the reactor core and then back in to achieve maximum burnup efficiency. Of course, that compact takes advantage of a DOE invested fuel form of triso particles. And it's a little bit of a unique fuel form in our compact. We're looking at annular type of fuel. Our coolant has got a lot of experience base, as many of our presenters talked about. It's a lithium fluoride, beryllium fluoride eutectic flib, of course. Everybody has their special different flavor of that, but ours is pretty much used as a chemical containment. Think about it as if our solid fuel form has a small leak, the salt basically soaks up all that material. This picture here, the larger picture you see is actually us melting the salt and synthesizing the salt in our S lab in Alameda, with that smaller picture being uh, something from historical at Oak Ridge. So what that gives us is a unique capability to combine a solid fuel form and the advantages of molten salts to create a reactor that has very unique large fuel temperature margins to what the triso particle will take 
and gives us the ability to have a much diminished containment structure uh, looking at a confinement type approach because the salt acts as part of our containment. So between the, the coated particle fuel, fully ceramic fuel system and that salt, that really is our containment. The rest of the system is really there to make sure we keep salt on the fuel. So it's kind of a unique structure there. We believe that that'll offer us an opportunity to dramatically reduce our capital costs based on that, right? And the civil construction is often the most expensive part of the reactor construction site. So we believe that this can greatly diminish those costs. We go through iteration cycles. We call these little loops that we're progressing through. So separate effects tests, small tests and surrogate systems, looking at small test sand, in situ uh, mechanical performance, and also development of the appropriate constitutive models and closure models based on those tests. And then we iterate those through larger and larger hardware loops, uh, culminating ultimately in the demonstration reactor and beyond the commercial reactor. But basically it was getting out of the paper reactor cycle was the key. The, the current industry gets a lot of stuck in plan and design and very little build. Um, we build things every day. Here's some pictures of some gear. So we have the R lab on the left there. You can see some of our surrogate fluid test stands. So these are typically separate effects tests. They're looking at either hydrodynamics or heat transfer. We use water for hydrodynamics, uh, a heating oil for heat transfer. So that's one advantage of the salt that we use is the surrogates are very good for those separate effects tests. We can do a lot better instrumentation in those than we can in salt loops. We have our S lab though, which is where we need to get a lot of experience handling the salts. Those are beryllium salts. And those can also be other salts as well. So we use fly NACA surrogates and some other salts when we need to. This all feeds into our uh, testing at our T facility. So this is then moving to larger scale tests. Think of full size component tests, both within surrogate fluids and also within salts, ultimately culminating in what we call a user facility, which our goal is to make that a full scale primary system to train commercial operators and commercial maintenance technicians so that they know how to operate and maintain the plant. This is reiterating our design approach, but now looking at the technology itself. So when we started, right, we started leveraging off the IRP program for FHR reactors, largely looking at mostly kind of paper designs with some demonstration of surrogate integral effects tests, and then maturing that rapidly through our capabilities to where we are today under the construction of the engineering test unit. A pretty much full-size primary system that's on equivalent scale with the Hermes demonstration reactor. It's under construction at our site in New Mexico today. We'll be taking delivery of the vessel soon, probably in the next couple of weeks. And construction of all the piping and everything is already in place and delivering of uh, major components is underway. Commensurate with that is also making sure we can make the salt. So our molten salt pilot plant is being delivered pretty much as we speak and commissioning will be happening over the next several months. And that will create the several metric tons of salt that we need for the engineering test unit, which is electrically heated. That'll also demonstrate some of the vertical manufacturing capability that we have in-house for many of those components. We're going through this iteration right now. So we're really in the middle of ETU and getting it up and running, dovetails into the Hermes reactor. So we've done a lot of work on Hermes to support the PSAR but we've got now time between construction start and our licensing activities to mature that design based on our learning from the engineering test unit and to close those technology gaps. You can see at Kairos, we believe hardware is worth a thousand calculations and we deploy a lot of hardware. And like everybody else who's doing that, yes, some of it does break and we learn lots of important things about how to fix it, how to clean it up and how to make sure it doesn't break the next time. Our goal then is to rapidly go from the Hermes reactor experience take that learning and move it into the full scale facility, which will commence with licensing of a commercial power unit and U facility construction to train operators and maintenance technicians. We're not using enriched flab and by enriched flab, I mean enriched in lithium seven to lower the tritium production, and improve the characteristics from neutronics of the salt. So this will just use a natural lithium in that salt. It's isothermal at this case because it's a pretty large unit. So we'll be heating it up and pumping salt around and exercising the various components of moving pebbles around. These are surrogate pebbles, so there's no fuel in them, no uranium. And also handling of the pumps, handling of the control ride drive mechanisms, which is important, and also being able to do maintenance on those facilities for high temperature systems is always a challenge. Why are we doing this? One, we want to establish the competitive costs through vertical integration. So we need to understand where the pinch points are in the supply chain, what our supply chain can do and what we need to do. And usually what we learn is that if you want to do it well, you do it yourself, but it is, you can't do that everywhere. Also supply chain of the raw materials. We talked about graphite and also the stainless steel materials that we use. 
Uh, we want to demonstrate that design integral through integration of the principal technologies to make sure they all work together and understand what the hard parts are and what we need to improve from the technology and then accelerate the experience base of training operators. So this is a new type of facility. There's not just going to be nuclear hazards like in an LWR or pressure hazards. There's high temperature hazards, there's beryllium hazards. So we need to make sure that we have solid operating procedures to make sure everything is safe, not just for the public, but for the operators who are maintaining the plant. We take a lot of little loops between these big hardware iterations, but we're constantly learning and progressing towards this commercial facility. For Hermes, it's a small scale unit. We're talking tens of megawatts, not kilowatts, not one megawatt, but tens of megawatts. And the goal of this is to demonstrate that Kairos power can deliver low cost nuclear heat. So it's going to reject that heat to the air. There won't be a power conversion system in here. This is a non-power reactor. But the key is that we focus on our cost target and can we hit it? And that provides some certainty to our future customers and our future investors. If we can do that at this scale, we have confidence we can scale up to the commercial unit. Also, it'll help answer some questions on key nuclear integration aspects and material aging and allow us to get operating experience at a safer, smaller scale of a nuclear unit and understand proper techniques, proper procedures and maintenance and remote maintenance is also key for the nuclear unit. We've partnered with Materion, Oak Ridge National Lab, Idaho National Lab, and EPRI in that submission. That was awarded in uh, December timeframe. And over the next roughly seven years, uh, we'll commit a cost share pretty much equivalent to the DOE share of $303 million. It's all underway right now. We're in the process of finalizing our contracting. In the meantime, we're continuing to work on Hermes and all our technology progressions. This hasn't slowed us down at all. It's going to be on the K33 site. We closed on that property earlier this year. Our goal is to achieve criticality in 2026, but there's a lot of things we need to do along the way in terms of licensing and construction activities, but our goal is to hit criticality then. Hermes will leverage a lot of proven technologies. Many of those actually were originated at Oak Ridge National Lab and the molten salt reactor experiment and other research associated there in the 1960s. We're investing about $100 million in that site and facility, and it'll create 50 time, 50, about roughly 55 full-time jobs on site that'll support uh, construction operation. Of course, there'll be more constructors there when the peak of the construction is underway, but this is roughly what it looks like over time. It's a collaborative effort. We're looking with the partners there, including TVA, to make sure that one, we're successful and that there's value added to the community and the industry from the efforts we're doing deploying this unit. Part of our licensing strategy associated with not only the Hermes demonstration reactor, but also the commercial reactor is early regulatory engagement. There's a lot of uncertainty there and a lot of risk. We chose to buy down some of that risk is to get early engagement. There's two advantages of that. One, it's a forcing function for us to make sure that we can develop the technologies and the methodologies and the software at the pace that we expect to meet our commercial timeline. It's also an opportunity for the regulator to learn about our technology and about where the learning needs to happen. So for many of our approaches and our topical reports, we use a two-step process where the first step is to get early regulatory engagement and buy-in that the methodology, if implemented and validated, would be successful. And then we go off and do that implementation and validation and come back with the final results. One that gives us certainty that we're not going to waste time developing methodologies that the regulator is not familiar with or a technology. And two, it gives the regulator certainty that they know what they're going to see from a validation and data aspect when we come in and ask for final approval and remove basically all the limitations that would be in the safety evaluation reports. We've also embraced the Part 50 process where we're looking at a construction permit application and an operating license application. We believe that gives us a technology flexibility to move quickly versus a Part 52 process. But eventually we plan once standardization occurs for the commercial units to move that to a Part 52 process where it makes more sense. Admittedly, we do know there is part 53 underway and we are working to understand that as it progresses and that might become part of our approach as we move forward. I wanted to highlight again that the PCR was submitted to the NRC last month. So when you look a little bit at our development schedule, you can see that we're right up to about starting up the engineering test unit. As with anything, when you're building large components, particularly during COVID, the supply chain has been, uh, I'm gonna say, frustrating at times, <laughs> but that's all part of making real stuff and you need to get good at handling that. So we're learning along the way and we feel that we'll be able to iterate quicker moving forward. You can see on the Hermes reactor timeline, 
Um, we've taken our conceptual design efforts from before, turned that into a reactor concept for the demonstration reactor, um, gone through our pre-engagement of our methods and design approaches, and submitted uh, our PSAR and soon the environmental report that'll complete the CPA submission. We're going to go through a review of that over the next year to 18 months with the hope of then immediately breaking ground after that. That'll be followed by uh, operating license application and an FSAR associated with that. Probably likely, you know, 2023, 2024 timeframe to hit our startup targets. Our next big hardware loop in between our little hardware loops will be the U facility, and that's the full scale primary demonstration unit for KPX, again, electrically heated, but that'll be at full scale with full scale components, just to make sure that we can train everybody and understand how the unit will work and get a sense of the scale. It will be coming pretty much hot and heavy along with in the middle of Hermes, probably construction is when that design and build will start and immediately following that activity, uh, will be the KPX, which will largely be left there, will be balance of plant, balance of plant design because the facility will get most of the primary system out of the way. But that's kind of roughly what our timeline looks like today. You mentioned that ETU wasn't using isotopically enriched lithium, but when you get to Hermes, are you going to be using isotopically enriched lithium? Yes, correct. We have a whole other uh, development activity in enrichment of lithium. That's a whole other supply chain that we're vertically integrating on. So we'll be doing that ourselves. Are you going to be making your own triso fuel? We're exploring all the options. I'll leave it at that. I'm going to say a, a relatively sensitive negotiation with the current suppliers. And we're trying to understand what cost certainty they can supply to us for Hermes. And then we're also evaluating other approaches if needed. So it's still yet to be determined. Uh, do you have specific areas of the supply chain that you're concerned with now? What, what's your focus? On the larger scale components, like large bore vessels and things like that. Now we're thin walled, so they're not forging, which many of the MSRs are, so it's a little less complicated. But even the current non-nuclear suppliers can't meet their own timelines. They're typically missing orders by six, 12 months. And so we found that to be, I'm going to say, largely unacceptable. So we're trying to learn from that. The other one that we found in working with some partners on were the more complex components. So looking at control rods, control rod drive mechanisms and pumps, there's just not a supply chain. They don't exist for these systems. So we're looking to either partner or develop many of those on our own just out of necessity. So on the, the graphite, it's going to be a constraint if we're successful. But right now we feel that we have a reasonable supply chain for the current needs. But as we move towards more rapid development and the commercial side, if we're deploying many reactors a year, we'll need to understand ways to increase nuclear grade graphite capabilities. So Dave Holcomb says, is Kairos really using a 10 CFR part 50 process for a non-power reactor? And <laughs> brackets Hermes question mark. No, that's a very good specific question. So technically, David, we are referencing 1537. All right, it's a non-power application, but it does use part 50 in terms of a construction permit and an FSR application. So it's both. Your talk has generated lots, lots of questions. Thank you so much.